You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. I'm Matt Garrett-Simovich, a PhD candidate at Northwestern University, studying Russian literature and film. And I'm Cameron Lalana, a literature enthusiast. We're two friends who met studying in Russia. We like talking about books so much that we made it into a podcast. Every episode, we dive deep into something we've read or watched. Our goal is to help you get more out of these works and maybe even learn a thing or two along the way. If you're interested in supporting us, you can head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. All right, Matt, what are we getting into this week? This week, we are reading The Tears and Smiles of Things by Andrei Sadamora with its two translators, Roman Ivashkiv and Sabrina Yassi. Sabrina is a translator of Uzbek, Russophone, and Ukrainian literature based in Oakland, California. She's a co-founder of Turkoslavia Translation Collective and Journal, both dedicated to Turkic and Slavic literature and translation. Currently, she's writing a dissertation on modern Central Asian literature at UC Berkeley. And I, uh, I do love the Turkoslavia merch, by the way. I've been had my <laughs> eye on that uh, after seeing that. Uh, and we're also uh, very glad to be joined by Roman, who teaches Slavic languages, literatures, and cultures at the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. His research interests include translation, comparative literature, and language pedagogy. Currently, he is writing a monograph on transmesis, a fictional representation of translation and translators in contemporary Ukrainian literature and film. With the Canadian writer and translator Aaron Morey, he published an English translation of the Ukrainian writer Yuri Izrik's collection of poetry entitled Smokes in 2019. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you for Glad having us. Here. Thank you for having us. Yeah. We're really excited to, given your specialties, uh, The Tears and Smiles of Things. It's a fascinating collection, but it, it did amuse me a little bit too. Um, Andrei Sanamora is a translator. We'll talk about him in just a moment. But to be talking about reading about translation, the process of it in translation was a funny a little <laughs> quirk of it reading this collection for me. Um, but we just want to kick it off. So Andre Sadamora, translator of classics, professor at the Ivan Franco University of Lviv, poet, and probably a new name for our listeners. In the introduction of the book, Professor uh, Markian Dombrovsky notes that The Tears and Spouse of Things is the first time he's been published in English. Uh, so before we get going, uh, I was wondering if we, um, if the two of you might be able to cover some of his life and work. Sure, I'll probably start on that, uh, and then Sabrina can add whatever whatever I miss. Um, so, as I went to school in Ukraine and I studied translation studies, um, so the Mora was uh, a big name for us as students, and I'm talking back in like 2000, 2005, um, and we knew him primarily as a tra- as the Ukrainian voice of classical antiquity. Because most of the things that we read in ancient Greek and Roman literature have been translated by him. And the list is so impressive that it's just it doesn't even make sense to, to start dropping those names, but he translated or 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 you know he translated people that that you know the whole the entire canon pretty much. So we read Lucretius and Ovid and Horace and Sappho and uh, the ancient Greek tragedy, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides. Um, so all of these guys, but then nobody ever really spoke about Sodomora as an original writer. And in fact, some people thought that he only started writing recently. And, you know, mind you, t- today and this year, he is probably 87, if I'm not mistaken, or 86 so in, his, in his late 80s. Um, but back then, um, we knew him as this, this great translator. And um, the chair of my translation studies department, Roxolana Zorivchak, um, would also praise him um, for his Ukrainian language. And back then, I personally couldn't relate to it. I, you know, honestly, I didn't care that much. I mean, we, we were all native speakers of Ukrainian, and that was all good. But, but you know, she emphasized how cool his Ukrainian is, which back then I, I just couldn't appreciate. And so many years down the road, and so, so this is the story. Uh, so this, this great man of genius who knows Latin and knows Greek and who brings these ancient masterpieces to uh, to contemporary Ukrainian readers. And, and one of his big things is like, antiquity is alive. And even that little slogan, we couldn't understand. Like, you know, why does it matter? I mean, these guys wrote a long time ago. Um, who cares? We've got lots of literature to cover these days, you know. And so so these were my first, you know, encounters with Sodomora, if you will. And then many years down the road, when, when you know, I chose translation comparative literature as my major, um, 
my former chair, Oksana Zarubchak, asked if I if I would care to translate a story or two. Uh, and so uh, this is how the whole journey started. But back to your question about Sodomora. So he started publishing these stories, th these little vignettes, a long time ago, but people didn't really know about this. And today he is extremely prolific. Um, to me, he's personally a kind of a Jorge Luis Borges figure in Ukrainian literature. He never received... Uh, enough recognition. I don't think that he's 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 got the you know. I think he deserves a lot more. But even in Ukraine, like when it comes to these prizes or something, and all of this is of course subjective. Uh, but but he never won anything super. Major. He did win a few a few awards, but nothing super major. Um, and I think um, you know that's a problem. And I'm not I'm not going to go there. So um, now he's extremely, despite being at such a you know respectable age. Let me put it this way. He's extremely prolific, extremely prolific. I think now there's so uh, Sabrina and I, and it took us quite a long time. Sabrina and I worked on the Tears and Smiles. So in Ukrainian, those were two separate collections. Now, by the time we managed to finish this translation, his new translation, The Memory of Things, uh, his new work, The Memory of Things came out. And now he's he's working on new books. So um, this guy is just so unbelievably impressive. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. Mm -hmm. Sabrina wants to add a little bit about maybe something more factual about him or anything about him. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sure. Just um, like you guys in our audience, I was introduced to Sadamoto's work recently um, through Oman. And yeah, I was just immediately stunned by his accomplishments as a translator once I read about them, having translated Homer, Augustine, Virgil, Sappho, Lucretius, Horace, like all of these greats. And then also being so well versed in world literature, and then also bringing in this whole sphere of Ukrainian literature. So it was clear to me that this was just an incredibly erudite person. And in terms of him not getting the recognition he deserves, that's certainly true. But you know, it's also the fact that he's just such an uncompromising stylist um, and academic. It's just not the type of thing that's going to appeal to everybody. But um, I think it's just so admirable that he's he's continued doing his thing and writing this really, I would say, experimental fiction. Um, because I was thinking about the subtitle of it, these story sketches and meditations, and I was like, which is which? I I wonder. You know, can you mm -hmm. kind of go through the <laughs> table of contents and say, okay, these are stories, these are sketches, these are meditations? But actually, I think they all have sort of aspects of all these different genres in them. Yeah. yeah. Um, in addition to all of this intertextuality, so yeah, the genre, yeah, but very, very well put, Sabrina. You know, the genre is definitely problematized. In fact, like I think the word that captures it all is vignette, but that's also problematic because because sometimes it's more like an essay, and sometimes it's like borders on nonfiction almost. So, yeah, it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. That was that was actually that was very funny. You bring that up. That was one of the very questions I had going into each of these because each one feels like a middle ground between. Uh, a translator's reflections, you know, academic essay, creative fiction, and it really blurs those lines in a super interesting way, um, which maybe we'll talk about a little more, but I'll, th I'll throw it over to Matt before we go off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I have a question more just from the process of, well, I guess not the process, but the evolution of translation, let's say. I found this to be the case in a, in a, in a lot of countries, right, where the translation and continual retranslation of these classics, um, our, our writing from antiquity, it gives us something new when we come to contemporary language. Um, and I always find that so fascinating. And I was kind of wondering if you can talk about that, that, that sort of process, like um, both as a translator, but also then uh, how that seeps into the, the, actual, the actual writing, the actual prose for Sadamora. Well, um, that's that's a difficult question. It's not an easy question. So, uh, as Sabrina just mentioned, his prose is not only profoundly intellectual and and in some respects elitist. And I'm trying to use the word elitist in a positive <laughs> as a positive word, um, but but also profoundly intertextual. And so, to me, it's like everything that he translated over the many many years. Interestingly, his first translation came out when he was only 25. 25, so he translates Menander's Discalus, a comedy that was newly discovered back at that, you know, so, so, and he was like the first person in the Soviet Union, because normally 
back in the Soviet days, it would be like Russian would be the dominant lingua franca, the dominant language. And then everything had to be done into Russian first. Um, and that was not just by accident. That was like the, the policy. Uh, but all of a sudden, this this young Sonomora makes this translation. And ever since, uh, he's been accumulating these works. And of course, it's only natural that when he started his own uh, writing career or when he and I think, you know, I today, I, and my, you know, my opinions on that change today, I feel like these two processes were were simultaneous almost. It's not like he at some point decided I'm going to stop being a translator and now I'm going to just write my own stuff. Um, so I think these were parallel processes. But anyway, so he's been he's been ingesting all of that stuff um, and not just ancient Greek and Roman, but also world literatures. Um, and eventually all of that is reflected in his prose today. Um, so Oftentimes we would like, your question was also about how it's reflected in language. His language is so incredibly exquisite. I'm a native speaker of Ukrainian and I kind of don't complain about my Ukrainian. You know, I don't feel like anybody, anybody can know a language perfectly, but you know, there are people who read and people who work with language, uh, they get to a level where they feel comfortable and, you know, stylistically and, and, and all sorts of other respects and registers. Um, but when I read so the model is Ukrainian, I'm humbled. Oftentimes when we were translating with Sabrina, I was like, Sabrina, I kind of know what this means because there's broader context and I can kind of, you know, take clues from the paragraph or or kind of think more about the story. But I swear, I don't know these words. So we ha I had to look things up. Oftentimes these words won't even be in the dictionary. All right. So one example I think that I give um, in, in my uh, translator's introduction is... Um, the word nalitni, so it was used about the wind in in the, the story, the silver-haired uh, wind. And it's a, like, I know what the word means. There's no one-on-one -on -one equivalent in English. And then you have to start researching and ha you have to start digging. And even though you dig deep or you try to dig deep, um, it's still problematic. So, um, you know, that, that, then, but interestingly, this word is not even his own invention. So my my gut reaction is like, oh my gosh, so the Mora concocted another word, <laughs> and now we have to deal with it. It's not even his own thing. It comes from one of you know, it comes from another great Ukrainian translator uh, who was by not accidentally killed by by Stalin's regime. So Mikola Zarov, he was he was exterminated physically, exterminated uh, in the first exile, and then to a labor camp, and then exterminated in the in the 1930s. So Mikola Zarov. So that word comes from him. So Sodomora, having read his translation, uses the word in his own creative writing. And this is how, um, you know, these translations keep uh, influencing uh, language and the evolution of language. I'll stop here because, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it also, I mean, thinking of him as a creative artist, you know, you have to bring some creativity to the translation of his work as well. Like you can't do a literal translation of something that is that artistic. So I think we came up with itinerance in the end for Nalitni because mm -hmm. there was really no sort of exact analog. Um, and also thinking about your question about how the, the language of the classics um, influenced translation here, it was an interesting sort of scavenger hunt for us to track down all the different um, intertextual references and allusions. And sometimes they would be sort of um, quotations that were not attributed and we would have to go back, sort of retranslate from Ukrainian into, you know, whatever English or whatever language we were going to be trying to um, use in the translation. And sometimes we found it, sometimes we didn't. Sometimes we had to ask Sadamora or um, Markian to help us. Um, and so, yeah, and then we had to deal with the issue of how to quote all of these things in the book as well. So usually we went to sort of established translations, um, but sometimes I think we did our own translations as well. Yeah. This this is a great point, Sabrina. So one one of our you know common references was this Loeb Library, Harvard uh, Harvard data, database of of uh, classical literature, um, and one one example just so that because it, it may sound a little complicated, what Sabrina just said. But one example that comes to mind is this, it's, and it's also one of my most favorite stories in the collection, Carpe Diem. So, but this famous catchphrase that you know people throw around today. 
like people generally understand what this means, like seize the moment, uh, enjoy the day, live in the present, blah, 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 all of these things. But we had to come up with a phrase. And so interestingly, our first step is like, let's look at the existing English translations. And there's a whole plethora, there's a whole bunch, and all of them very drastically. And it was like, wow. And it, it kind of, it also brings us, it reminds us of how sometimes as readers of translated literature, we kind of take take this take these translations to kind of be the final like here is the meaning here is what the author said but who really knows what the author said and then and then the, this multiplicity this this plethora of options that are already available in published english translations was already like mind boggling so we start thinking and then on top of that comes Sotomora's own interpretation so i like to, to i like this example a lot because this is this kind of shows you the evolution so, so the Mora retranslated Horace, so he, not retranslated, he translated twice. One time as a young man, probably in his 20s or maybe 30s. Um, so, and then back then he translates this as um, seize the day or something along those lines into Ukrainian, right? And that's what the, that's what the, the phrase kind of means, seize the day, carpe diem. But then, you know, in English, as I just said, you would have all sorts of possibilities like harvest the day and plug the day and seize the day and so on, uh, catch the day. But then 25 years down the road, Sodomora revisits his own translation back from the 80s. And all of a sudden, the spin that he sees now, his new interpretation of that famous Horace's phrase, now is waste not a day. Interestingly, this interpretation is dictated by two things. Not just by like, oh, now I'm a mature or a slightly older, more experienced man. So for me, it's not it's no longer about pleasure and delight and like, oh, let's have fun while we can and drink wine on, on you know, on the coast. Um, now for him, this means something different, like waste not a day <laughs> for me is more about work ethic. It's like it's almost like I can I can see the silver haired guy riding <laughs> away feverishly every day, like producing, like don't waste a day, like keep riding. That's number one. But number two, his own explanation is that all of a sudden, as a much older man, he is now interested not just in the meaning of that phrase, but in the soundscape of it. In other words, in how the the rhythm of the Latin um, progresses. And for him, he comes up with this difficult concept, Coriam. So, um, which is like choky and iambus together, ta-da, ta-da, so carpe diem. Um, and all of a sudden, none of these existing possibilities captures that rhythm for him. And he is interested in like this, you know, conflation of form and content. And so he he comes up with what, what to him in Ukrainian sounds as nyanez marnui, so don't waste a day or waste not a day. Um and you know, interestingly and coincidentally, that's also the phrase that that happens to be present in uh, the English translation of Goethe's Faust. Um, I don't know if there is any Sabrina. I didn't have enough patience to go there because you know the, this project would have would have taken many more years if we if we had done that. Right. But but there's that you know there's that trajectory as well, and that's just fascinating to me. It's just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just to give you a little more sense of um, the story itself, Carpe Diem. It's not only this. Um, examination of the phrase and the history of the phrase, but he actually adds this very narrative element to it. So it's really about the relationship between two people. So these stories are extremely, you know, erudite, as I said, um, but they're also very readable. And he makes these stories relatable in a certain sense. So he really does kind of bring the ancients to us. That was something that kind of struck me about uh, that story in particular. You, we both talked about this, the, the like the heavy intertextuality. Of course, this is you know this is looking back at antiquity, but at the same time, it's so very. It's all about very present struggles, very present day to day issues, and also Roman, like you said, um, the like we're not reading this in translation, obviously, but it was it was such a beautiful piece of writing, especially uh, what was it, the trochee, the waves coming in, the I am going back out, like that was such a beautiful passage and i can only imagine what it reads like you know in the original ukrainian but it really does it meshes meshes them together very well <laughs> thank you thank you do you ever feel like you had sadamora kind of looking over your shoulder while you were doing the translation just because like <laughs> i feel like even like 
the the text itself like is is so reflective and that's why i thought meditation personally from the subtitle was the was the the most applicable word the whole time it felt like sort of a meditation on not only the language itself but then almost that like he could foresee the the difficulties with his own translation in some ways um and i, I it's not a task i envy by <laughs> yeah. by any means i think i think that's a that's a wonderful question um and i think i i will start I will, I will say that the, the first thing that I'm going to say to answer that question is that I was so lucky and fortunate to have Sabrina with me. Um, I, I'm, I was, and now I'm even a more, uh, a stronger believer in collaborative translation, but the weight of Sudomora, if I had like, you know, I started like one or two stories by myself and then I quickly realized uh, that this is just not going to work, not just because I'm not a native speaker of English and it does take a poet it does take a poet and a writer to do this. But then with Sabrina, this weight of Sodomora for me personally was, it was still really heavy. And we were having a lot of difficult discussions, a lot of, I would even say like linguistic arguments, if you will, <laughs> yes. about, 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 these, about these choices. Because to me, it's like, no, no, no. Let's say it the way, like, let's bring him closer or, or let, let's be closer to the original. Although I'm just to be honest, and 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 very straightforward about it. I'm totally not a believer in this fidelity or faithfulness. I think you know these are religious and family related concepts. You want to be faithful to your partner uh, or to God or to whoever you believe in. Uh, but in in translation, this you know this fidelity thing doesn't make sense to me. But I was always like, oh, but look at this. You know that he's using this part of speech, and this is how you know this his syntax is extremely complicated. And I was like, let's do, let's try and mimic that structure. And Sabrina was always trying to kind of bring me back to the English. Because like eventually, as the English readers who are going to be using reading this, and you know, so we have to create a work of art in English rather just than just always like, oh, he, here's how Sudomora had it. Because in you know, ultimately, the result that he produced in Ukrainian is exquisitely sophisticated, uh, eloquent, you know, prose that sometimes reads like poetry almost, uh, with with extremely complicated syntax and, and everything. And so in English. Staying close, in fact, in in many cases, meant doing injustice to him, like not doing justice to that to that very rich original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that making an author readable and comprehensible in another language is its own type of fidelity. Because, right. you know, thinking of Sadamura, like he's not such like just from reading him, even though I, I don't know him as well as you do, I can tell he's not so much of a pedant that he would mm -hmm. want that type of translation. Um, and then to your other question about how, you know, having him sort of sitting on your shoulder, I felt that way in a good way, I think, um, just in terms of sort of getting to know the contours of his mind and his experience with this work. Like there's so much um, that's sort of concrete and tactile uh, in addition to all the kind of heady intellectual stuff in this work. So you really get to know his vision of Lviv, the city, like you get to know the cafes that he goes to, the sort of streets that he goes down, the windows he looks into, the dead tree that he passes <laughs> every day on his way to the archives and looks at its shadow, you know, all of these minute things. And then also, you know, it's in the title, of course, The Tears and, Tears and Smells of Things, so all of these objects that are so dear to him and um, that have sort of accumulated meaning and memories over the years. So it's very Proustian in that sense. Um, and uh, yeah, that just gives you such a great sense of, I guess, the texture of his life and experience. And that really comes I through. I wasn't going to say it because mm -hmm. everybody, that's Yeah, like the, I mean, it's um, obvious. Like when, <laughs> yeah, and I feel like in grad school, like once during a seminar, everyone, somebody will say it's very Proustian. So it's like, okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll be more specific. But since you brought it up, uh -huh. I, I had, I it's was, Proustian, you know, but as, much more concise. Well. I would say. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, and condensed. Yeah. condensed. Yeah, yeah. Quite, yeah. quite a bit more so. Well, it's, just a bit of a trap because when we got it from the publisher, I thought, okay, this will be a quick read. It's short, uh, you know, it's short stories. And then I was like going through it and I, and I went downstairs and I, I was up reading for like two hours and I went down to my fiance and I went, great, I'm 15 pages through. And she was like, you read 15 pages in two hours? And I said, yeah, and I feel like I probably need to reread it. <laughs> Just imagine how, I need a break. how we felt translating it. Yeah, I think some of these stories we translated four different times, honestly. Well, yeah, I said, okay, well, I sat there and I, it took me 10 minutes to read the short story, but then I kind of just sat there and I was like thinking about it for like a half an hour. So, <laughs> so this is so very true because, but, you know, if, 
this is what it took you to read for us like sometimes a paragraph would take you know th those two hours and you're like really i wrote half a page in two hours <laughs> yeah. and you're like what's happening i mean and and also it's like you're not composing this you, ha you have that original you know on on the screen or on the side and you're looking at it and it's still it's, it was it was unbelievable yeah it's kind of funny. There's an interview that uh, Sonomura did with Craft Magazine, or maybe the Craft Magazine was translated in English. And he talks about reading ancient literature as slow reading, saying that he kind of he often has to put them down and go think about it, not because it's you know boring or difficult, but just because he he just needs to reflect on that. And that's what I felt like with every one of these stories. I would like mm -hmm. read it, put it down, and ju then just think about my life. I would you know even even not. I, f I forget which story it's in, but he talks about memory as not always remembering the important thing, but as like these random strange snippets. And it was so funny. That was a, like like a lightning strike into my into my brain. Mm -hmm. um, I think, what was it? The, oh gosh, I don't remember the name of it, but the, the light bulb without a shadow, you know, mm -hmm. struck me of like standing outside of my own apartment building and looking up into the windows mm -hmm. of like, because we've got, uh, my apartment has giant, you know, wall to wall windows. And if you leave the curtains open, you can see inside. So if you stand in the street, you can see in everyone's living rooms. And sometimes I'll, I'll be out there and I'll just look at it and think about everyone's lives. And, you know, like that, that's the kind of reflection that strikes me as I'm, as I'm reading this. It's amazing how this very, it's like re reflective of that, that process of reading um, ancient texts, but in a much more modern piece, obviously. Yeah. So very true. Yeah. That's a really cool comment. I love that. Yeah. And also, I think the experience of reading the book kind of recreates the experience of translation in a way, because when you're reading an ancient text, of course, you're kind of translating it in your head. Um, and Sadamora is a, is a translator. So that's kind of uh, his point of reference. Um, and translation, you know, I've heard it say that it's the, the closest form of reading. And uh, yeah, it's it's a special experience, especially in this day and age when, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, but sometimes it is difficult to kind of sit down and concentrate on a book. But translation is something that really forces you to <laughs> hone in on the details. And it's very absorbing. Um, yeah, the sort of like suspense uh, of translation is real. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting. If we could continue on with that for a moment, because uh, Roman, in your translator's introduction, you take this line from uh, Jacques Derrida, that, uh, that calls translations both simultaneously necessary and impossible, and um, <laughs> which is a, a very fun phrase. And I think it's especially applicable here uh, because uh, do, were there free? We've been talking a bit about the process of translation. Of course, uh, Sotomayor himself is a translator. Were there difficulties in translating an author who seems almost aware of the issues that arise from translating his own <laughs> work? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, in fact, uh, so so that's a great quote, uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, y y is and used to be when I was back in you know in grad school, uh, um, my, my, one of my favorite philosophers. Is extremely difficult to understand, often misinterpreted. But that phrase that you quoted, uh, simultaneously necessary and impossible, it captures these paradoxes of translation very very well. Um, one other thing that is also attributed to Derrida, and I, I think I also mentioned this in the in the introduction, is this idea of what's really untranslatable. So for Derrida, basically, the economy will always be different, or, you know, the, the, the economy will al always betray the asymmetries between languages, and not just on the grammatical or linguistic level, but also the cultural, the political, and so on, and so forth. But um, one true untranslatable, according to Derrida, is the presence of multiple uh, languages or the reflection on the, so this meta literariness um, in one poetic event. And to me, that was precisely what what Sodomora was after in in um, one of my favorite stories. In fact, the, my, probably my favorite story, The Felt Shadow. Because what he does there, not only does he play with... Um, Federico Garcia Lorca's uh, uh, The Song of the Barren Orange Tree, he also enters into a, a really interesting debate with another translator who did translate Lorca into Ukrainian. And this guy was also a man of genius. And I think Sudomora is fictionally tracing his genealogy uh, through, you know, so referring back to uh, Mikola Lukash, who, you know, together with Rehori Kocher. So these were the two greatest translators of Ukrainian literature um, uh, uh, of all time, the 20th century. And so the Mora probably sees himself in that lineage. And so he enters this kind of fictional debate with Lukash, of, of course, is, you know, he's passed 
now um, he's no longer alive. And but Sotomora kind of discusses like how he would have approached um, uh, uh, Garcia Lorca's uh, 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 poem if he were to translate it. But then, interestingly, the punch that that kind of kills the translator, if you will, the the, the last <laughs> straw that breaks the translator's back is a, a, a beautiful pun that um, that Sodomora comes up with. So, you know, so, so the, uh, the, 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 the crucial line in the poem, in both Garcia Lorca's poem and in Sodomora's uh, 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 story, is uh, woodcutter cut my shadow, right? And so the word shadow in Ukrainian is tiny, tiny. Uh, for Sodomora, it's E is a very high sound, and interestingly, Sodomora comes up with this onomatopoeic way of capturing the sound that the axe makes when cutting the tree. And so this is where Sabrina and I were like, oh my God, like, you know, this is something, this is exactly what Derrida meant. Like, so shadow is a key concept. So you cannot replace shadow with anything else because that's, you know, that's a very visual story. It's about, you know, it's, it's about lightness and dark and darkness. Um, and these two concepts are recurrent in Sonomoto's writing. But then it's also very visual because it's a visual thing that you can, you know, we, we were struggling with all these verbs, like, you know, what, what does the shadow do in Sonomoto's original? It, it carves itself on the ground. But then, you know, Sabrina and I had to come up with lots of creative ways to kind of capture that that process. But then the team, the, the axe, the shadow that, you know, the shadow is basically in Ukrainian the same word that the axe makes. This is where you pretty much give, give up because, you know, in the in the in, and, and so so this also exemplifies brilliantly how meaning and form are so inseparable in literature. So and for translation, it's bad news. For translators, it's bad news because if you if you feel like you want to go after the meaning, well, then you lose the form. If you go for the form, well, then you kind of distance yourself from the meaning. And that's that's probably you know I I teach translation theory, so to me that's the biggest dilemma that's the biggest conundrum that underpins the entire enterprise of translation mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's a situation where we did some slightly strategic glossing and where the seams of the translation sort of become visible and i don't think there's anything wrong with that you can acknowledge that you know you're not equal to the task at some right. point um so i think what we said was uh oh yeah here it is woodcutter cut down my teen <laughs> you know and in that Ukrainian noun, teen, for the Spanish sombra, I could hear the lightning blow of an axe, too quick even to reproduce an echo into the flesh of a tree. Teen. Um, so yeah. just, you know, explaining how the different languages are coming into play here, because, yeah, you're never going to be able to do exactly what he does. I think I thought I did did that artfully. I didn't I did not when I was reading through that story, I did not notice even, you know, like a break in the storytelling itself. It's given that this is such a self-reflective collection, I don't think even think I questioned in that moment. I was curious about it, but that was just me. I, for me, it's just something I always find interesting is like when you choose to keep something in the original language or when you choose to uh well, I guess I mean it's all translated, right? But um you know, it's um, it's not something that happens by accident. It is a conscious choice and decision to leave something in the original language, knowing that it's going to people who don't speak that language. Um, so I just find it very interesting to kind of hear a little bit more about, like, you know, why maybe in that instance that could be left, or, um, you know, I, it always makes me think there's there's something more um, that I should be paying attention to in those in those specific places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as I sort of gain experience and confidence as a translator, I tend to leave more of the original um, and try to trust the reader more to recognize those sort of moments of friction and pause and think about them and why they're left there. Yeah, that's a great point. For me, it's all, it's also like the motivation is uh, the fear to over translate, to over explicate. And mm -hmm. like, cause, cause on the one hand, our job is like, Oh, interpret this for the readers or interpret it for yourself first and then express it or capture it somehow for the English readership. But then there's always this kind of danger of over interpreting or like doing too much. Um, and you know, th this is what, so, so the, the way Sabrina, I, I loved how she put it, like trusting the reader or, or allowing the reader to do, to do the work. For themselves yeah and that was just with ukrainian but then there i, I i'm losing the uh, the story where this took place but the um 
uh, going to the archive and the um, the the phrase in Polish, and so then you have multiple uh, the, <laughs> multiple ways the way something may sound to a Ukrainian speaker, or like Polish might sound to a Ukrainian speaker versus you know how it might sound to an English speaker, and, and the way that um, well, I mean, you've brought up the way that sound has played an important role in. Uh, the original, of course, and that's something that's ex- extremely difficult, I must imagine, to t- try to convey across languages. Right. But this kind of, it also harkens back to this point that I made previously about, you know, multiple languages. And so the Mora, so the Mora loves to do that. There's also, there's more Polish because Lviv used to be um, under Polish rule for some time. And, um, you know, um, um, Polish is the language that most people speak or understand at least uh, very well. Uh, there's also some instances of German in the story. Um, and so the more I incorporate is the seamlessly, but then there's this question of perception, you know, because it's one thing when I'm reading as a Ukrainian sp- speaker um, uh, uh, and then somebody who understands Polish, I'm reading a po- something in Polish, although he's he glosses these, these uh, uh, you know, in- inserts. Uh, but then the perception of an American reader would be, or an English speaking reader generally would be different. Um, so, so, you know, and that's, I don't think there's, there's anything that can be done about it, but that's also the beauty of it. That's, that's the beauty of literature. So that we are all uh, free uh, to interpret the work of art the way, you know, and bring our own experiences to the table and maybe and even make, make the work richer, you know, through our experiences. And I, I kind of, uh, you, you mentioned this, and we had had read this as well. That in the original Ukrainian, these are these are two separate works: the tears of things, the smiles of things. And so we were kind of curious um, when you were making your selection how the, how does that process actually look? Why did you choose um, you know kind of kind of these as your as as your combination? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Maybe was Sabrina contentious? may disagree. <laughs> I, I think that we, I, when easy, I came to it, it was already established the the table of contents. The easy the easy answer is uh, we chose the ones that were easier. No, um, like we chose <laughs> we we chose the shorter ones. Um, we chose the ones that um, that that we could relate to that resonated, uh, and many of them are great. Some of them are more specifically rooted in. Um, in Lviv, and you know, on the one hand, that could be a great thing because because Sabrina talks in the introduction about how you know he presents so so for for um, anglophone readers, Lviv uh, comes across as this great uh, multicultural uh, uh, locus, this great multicultural city uh, where things converge and, and mingle and so on. Uh, but some stories that that were not included were a little bit too specific so so that would take a lot a lot more probably glossing a lot more footnotes we do provide uh footnotes uh end notes actually in the book and also we do a little glossary for the cultural things because like one of one of the recurrent words in many stories is the word kamyanice and then that's a very typical that that's also a polish word um so if you if you visit in Lviv, uh, not these days because of Russia's genocidal war, unfortunately, but maybe ho- hopefully sometime soon, uh, you will see those and you realize what they are. You look this up in the dictionary, the dictionary tells you tenement, which maybe in Scotland, this is perceived differently because because many of these Lviv communities, these houses, these mansions remind me of, of how, you know, buildings look, some buildings look in downtown Edinburgh. But still, you know, you say tenement and then somebody from New York almost like imagines these new, you know, like like something totally different, maybe concrete based, but but totally different. And so um, in many stories, this this word had to, you know, we, we had to struggle. So we decide to like, let's transliterate and then also let's gloss and then we explain it in the um, in, in the glossary. Um, but yeah, so so. The ones that we we also like the select the, the selected stories um, we felt like they would appeal to readers regard you know so they they do capture a good deal about Ukraine but they are also more universal more international so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think this was we didn't have a lot of interaction with Sadamora in the process, but this was one point that he did weigh in on at the beginning. I believe he provided us with a list of his sort of yeah. top picks, and then from those we kind of whittled it down a bit and chose um chose some of our favorites and yeah i think that roman's favorites 
tended to be the really intertextual ones and mine were the sort of more concrete um detailed ones and yeah the selection of stories i think it really gives a, a good sense of the breadth of his style so yeah there's some like carpe diem or um, the felt shadow that have all this intertextuality and um, there's some that take place in the city. There's some that take place more in the countryside. And those are more from the smiles, I believe, the smiles exactly. of things um, that are sort of these memories of his childhood, like Mama Smile or um, a jug of wild strawberries where he's sort of remembering the fragrance of these strawberries and it takes him on this journey through memory. <laughs> um, or the, back or not the only string. to his childhood. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the string is another one where he hears like this plucking of a string and it takes him back to his early childhood and then back to kind of a prehistory. Um, I think in, w in one interview, he said something like the tears uh, of things are more, more nostalgic and the, the overall tonality is kind of gloomier and sadder, but the smiles of course are, 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 are happier stories because they go back to childhood and he loves this idea. But also I think Sabrina mentioned something along those lines already, but uh, um, memory is probably a protagonist in most of these stories because everything is happening through these memories or recollections or or acts of remembering and then you know so these the, the layers pile up and you know so so that that's probably one thing that unites the first two collections because and i think i'm kind of justified in saying this because the final the final collection and the what might technically be a trilogy is the memory of things so finally he, he kind of reveals his actual um the keyword there you know memory are you working on the memory of things already? I I have a copy. I think it came out either 2022 or 2023, maybe even. I I have a I have a I don't have a, an actual physical copy. I have a photograph copy. But yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm I really yeah. So so that's I, except that you know translation unfortunately and a brief comment maybe for for the listeners about the status of translation that many translators like Sabrina and I are fighting for. But translation is not considered an academic, like, you know, uh, neither Sabrina nor I uh, will ever get any, you know, actual credit. We we appreciate the readers and we did this primarily as, you know, that, that's a work of love. But um, in academia, that just won't count. So if we keep translating and not, you know, working on our scholarship per se, um, then it, it may not, it may kind of be detrimental to our careers as academics. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, th so this is something that readers need to, and generally everybody needs to realize that these translations. You know, I'm not even going to like underpaid, underappreciated, blah blah blah. But even in terms of like status, I would love to maybe try and and do another thing, maybe do his poetry. But she told me explicitly, "Don't touch my poetry." Like, <laughs> not for me, but, but pretty close, because <laughs> yeah. it's like he he thinks it's untranslatable because it's still very heavily rhymed in Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, and, but but I would I would love to maybe even like get started on the memory of things, uh, but because we're so swamped with all the other commitments and you know and other work that it, it probably have to wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we're still recovering from translating this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a great thing to bring to the fore. So thank you. Um, it's also great that you mentioned memory. That was um, we'll maybe talk about that more in a second. But that was one of my favorite themes, especially looking back in this very particular idea of malleability of memory, especially even the, this idea of the smiles thing in the back half of the book where we are, I assume, more of those stories talking about, you know, the garden, um, was it the string mama smile, all these stories. And there's always there's always a tinge of sadness at the end there. I remember it struck me in particular, there's the story of the garden, which is all about your senses and this amazing like childhood memory of the garden and then recollecting uh, German tanks rolling over it in 1944. And that's a, a number of these stories kind of have that 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 particular bent at the end there. Um, and it just it reminds me of, of talking to people looking back on their life so much of like a conversation I had with a coworker once about yoga. And he talks about a friend of his who, you know, gained all his flexibility back. Very boring workplace conversation. Then he just kind of ended like staring off and it's like, well, it didn't do him much good. He got hit by a car anyway. And he just kind of stared and said, oh, sorry, I don't know why I said that. And, you know, it reminds me of, like these so many small, small moments, um, which uh, not not especially poignant, but this is what, what our lives are made up of. Uh, but before I get too much into, sorry, we're we're used to talking about this ourselves. So, um, but let's turn to the collection itself. Uh, it starts off with this essay, "People Amidst Things," uh, which is a meditation 
more or less, um, this line from Virgil and the story from Horace. Um, and you try, you know, roughly translate that, that phrase, uh, tears are in the nature of things. We've been talking about that. Um, could you, could you kind of help uh, us and maybe our readers understand Sotomayor's task with this collection? Like what, what does this mean? What, what are, why are we talking about all of this? Why is he leaning on Virgil here? You know, he mentions in that interview we talked about earlier that his favorite theme is man and things. <laughs> What's this relationship between humans and their objects? Yeah, that's that's a great question. It's very complicated. We had to do a lot of research. So, um, of course, the line comes from Virgil, uh, sunt lacrima rerum. So th there are tears, sunt lacrima, there are tears. And then rerum, grammatically, for anybody who cares, uh, I'll have to go quick. Um, rerum is the genitive plural. So, basically um of things but then there's been numerous interpretations and again sabrina and i had to do a lot of digging uh, looking at the existing english translations of, of virgil and some people would say some people would omit that line completely and like rephrase rephrase this um this line so like just avoid saying this verbatim pretty much or like have their own reading have their own interpretation expressed differently in english and so in many cases, we're like, where is that line? There's, there's the, that line is missing, the, the line that we actually need for the title. And, you know, um, and so then the question arose, what do we do with that, you know, the genitive plural, which in English needs a preposition. And so you need the of things or in things or maybe something else. And then you're, you, and then kind of you get, you get bogged down in the meaning of this. So, so does it mean that things are crying? Does it mean that we are crying? Who's doing the crying? You know, and that, and, but this is the beauty of it because uh, according to Sotomora himself, somebody should write a thesis. Somebody should write a dissertation on that, just that one line in Virgil and what it meant. Um, and, and, and he, and he kind of, you know, so, so for him, there's definitely this nostalgia that we have for the things that we lose, but things not just taken. Of course, he also talks about material objects. He does talk about material objects, and especially in in you know in the smiles of things, uh, he talks about the things that we lose and no longer have, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the, the the world between the window panes. Um, that's a, a fantastic little story about like collecting things. Um, but then, of course, it's also about bigger things in life um uh, and i think we say this on the on the back cover uh so you know um things like happiness and loneliness and aging and everything so so a lot of, a lot of it is about about sotomora himself so the bigger things in life um and i think you know as sabrina already said like the the, the stories that have been selected by whatever logic <laughs> um they capture um this the, the the ambiguity of of what it may mean or what, what it originally might have might have meant in Virgil, uh, but also in the subject matter that Sotomora Sotomora is trying to cover. Mm -hmm. And maybe this would be a good point for me to jump in with a little reading from the Owl, mm -hmm. which is one of the stories yeah. that I like the best. And in this story, um, he takes this sort of real or metaphorical trip into the attic of his childhood home and. Um, re-encounters all of these objects that have been laid away there. So he says, we don't lay hands on something that's been a friend through work and relaxation, joy and sorrow, weekdays and holidays, and simply toss it to the wind. And this is why layers of abandoned objects agglomerate in the attic. To take account of them or just to sort them would be one of those incredible feats that is recounted only in fairy tales. In the middle of it all, like a boat that has been survived, that has survived miraculously intact through a terrible shipwreck is an ashwood cradle suspended from the rafters. Lifts, listing and leaning in the attic shoreless expanses, it's on the verge of sinking, dissolving in the deluge of things. The eye finds nothing to rest upon. Objects upon objects, large and small, wooden and metal, ceramic and clay, wicker and woven. But it's hopeless. We can't begin to sort them using such categories, not by size and shape, nor by material. There we find a quaint, sooty paned iron lantern from centuries past. It was once attached to a carriage, broken fauteuil with springs poking up from rotten fabric, parasols, and all kinds of toys. There too are the remnants of objects whose purposes we can no longer guess. 
When we bend down and rubbish through them, these incredible things beg to be held, speaking up from that massive junkyard, a little whirligig on a carved stem that once turned beneath the glass cupola in the sun, a luxurious and artistic piece of ironwork, the frame of a tabletop oil lamp adorned with griffins, a large tasseled lampshade for a hanging salon-style lamp of a stiff, formerly sun-yellow fabric, a broken hourglass and a non-functional clock, the one with no sand, the other with no hands, people's everyday, every-night companions, objects that gave forth their voices, shining, moving, comforting, helping, measuring the march of hours and minutes and transporting us to the world of fairy tales, things that now seem to amount to nothing but are still immeasurably more dear to us than new ones, more dear because of the souls that people have breathed into them. New things can't die because there's no life in them yet. Thank you. That was one of my favorite lines from this entire collection. Actually, my favorite, one of my favorite parts is after, immediately after that, the transition. Mm. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. you know, back to the, back to me going Absolutely. into the end. <laughs> it has a very chatty tone to it, I will say. I, yeah, maybe this helps get it, you know, that question, what is our relationship between us and our things? Uh, because there's a very, there's a very potent sense of, you know, ob- like that line, new things can't die because there's no life in them yet. We impart ourselves into these things. And something, I, another thing I noticed these stories, like I think two cases of disappearances, and there's the one, the, uh, the I forget the name of it, but the straw, when the, the woman who gives the narrator strawberries every summer and then suddenly she disappears. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. And then there's the whirly gig where there's the man who, you know, working yeah. really, and suddenly he also disappears. But in the same way that um, uh, they sort of, you know, they they had their memory exists within us. Each of these objects, their memory exists within us. But also, you know, they they live the lives of people around them that that exists outside of us. And I think being in the context of this attic, you know, the narrator, even if there's no personal connection there, you might with the person. There's this sense that someone there had this, and it's it's benign, but also a little haunting in the way that you look at almost this graveyard of things where there is meaning and there is love. But you don't have the context for that. It's like walking, literally like walking to a graveyard. You sense all this meaning and love and memory, literally, you know, hundreds of years, and you don't know mm-hmm. any of that. And that's something mm-hmm. that's a little a little haunting. It made me almost, uh, I feel like I'm debasing this work, but it made me think of a video game. Uh, it's like a, a little like indie game where you walk around a house and you collect cassette tapes and it plays uh, sounds or plays little text for you. And the basic idea is of um, a ho- houses as living things, as, or as, as people like us that we've constructed, and we've put that into it. And what happens when you leave a house alone for decades and decades and it falls into disrepair, this almost sentient being in its own right that falls into sort of a madness after so much time alone? What happens when you return and you trans, you know, transgress in that or trans, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm remembering a much easier word than transgress in there, but I'm forgetting a much trespass. easier word. Trespass. Trespass. Thank you. Thank you. Trespass into that, that, that space. And that's really what struck me as I'm reading this, this collection, this very strange life our, our objects have. Um, I don't know if I'm, how that diverges from your reading, but um, that's, a, that's a great put. observation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I think it is, it is Yuri. Yeah. Especially the end of the story where, um, yeah, he finally encounters this carcass of an owl that has spread its wings out over kind of collecting all of these objects. And it's so it's, it's also eerie because we know the owl is the bird is dead mm-hmm. and it, it's been sitting there for, or lying there for a while you know, in that attic. But, um, but then the wonderful, again, this onomatopoeia for like, like you know, the sound. So the body is dead, but but it, it, you can still hear the sound. Um, and also, interestingly, in many, so so two, two quick comments here before I forget, because one big decision that had to be made was about, so in Ukrainian, he keeps saying things. And it's kind of interesting because in Ukrainian, the word for thing is rich, rechi, and it it is uh, weirdly and probably uncannily reminiscent of the actual Latin word, which is the word in, in Republic. So res publica, so the public thing. Um, but Sabrina and I at some point had to kind of carefully weigh uh, our, our word choices when we were talking about these things, because at times the word thing felt a little too repetitive or too broad at times. And so we, you know, the strategy that I think Sabrina came up with was to sort of interchange this a little bit. Like it's some, in some cases, we say objects where we feel it's more about material things. We say objects and at times we say things. And so this is how, you know, we kind of we were trying to st- strike that balance. 
But another thing that I wanted to mention that respect is like, you know, so things, but also remembering things and, and going back to this point of memory, one big, um, big uh, uh, slogans that Soromora uh, uh, has um, in his arsenal, his white arsenal, is um, this idea of history. And it, it may seem a little counterintuitive because on the one hand, Soromora is a big fan of Horace and he's like, oh, don't you know don't dwell on the past like live in the moment so this carpe diem thing that we've already discussed but on the other hand so the more kind of likes this idea of embracing history and one of the stories and now i forget which one but anyway um probably the the presence historicum or something so he has this line about who doesn't live by the past or with the past or in the past or more broadly who doesn't live the past doesn't live at all that presented a huge dilemma for us because in English, again, you kind of need the preposition for this past, for this remembering of the past. Uh, but in Ukrainian, it's just the instrumental case. The instrumental case is like write with a pencil, it's like use something as your instrument. And in Ukrainian, that doesn't require a preposition, as in most Slavic languages, I guess. Um, and so, so the Mora just says, Kto ne nulim, ne so who doesn't live the past, who doesn't kind of cherish the past, who doesn't embrace the past, doesn't live at all. And that was like a very, very tricky line to to um, convey in in English because um, you do need that preposition. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want it to sound like who dwells on the past because uh, that, you know, that that creates a paradox with Horace. So yeah, but um, this idea of the past, of remembering and cherishing the past through memory, of course, and in his case, through writing, I think as well. Yeah, I um, for that reason, speaking on memory, uh, not a lot of love has been given to the mitten so far. Uh, mm -hmm. That one, I, that one, I like quite a lot. It reminds me of uh, mm -hmm. uh, "Song of the Final Meeting" um, a little bit. I don't know, I had that going through my head when I was reading it, but um, j just the way that the the mitten is sort of the inciting incident, uh, the inciting incident into the narrator's memory, and then it comes back at the end of the story. And there's there's a couple references throughout a couple of the other stories about the way that time is measured. I know in the world between window panes, talking about how it's how it's measured differently in that world, uh, and it sort of seems to me that that's the world that he's he's trying to access and kind of call upon for a lot of these stories. And so um, it's not so much a maybe a question, but but an observation. And I'm curious to hear if you sort of read this in, in a similar way, but just the. Um, you know the way that time works in all these stories it, it doesn't you know accord to this linearity but um we we always have that past that we can access kind of with us sometimes willingly or unwillingly um you know sometimes it's it's against our will we're just kind of thrust into a, a remembrance uh in a way uh like, like this mitten and i thought that that was such a such a such a beautiful way to kind of put it i guess yeah, no, very, very, very well put. Really appreciate it. it it's it's so uh, rewarding and so reassuring, so encouraging to hear you got you guys talk about this because this is exactly what we hoped our readers would be able to do. And you're doing this, so Sabrina and I should feel excited and happy about this. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Markian Dombrovsky who wrote um, who wrote the introduction. So he talks about this concept of time. We were we were a little bit worried that maybe you know the way he talks about it may 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 sound a little too down, like too philosophical almost like you know going into great detail. But this concentric time and concentric space, the time space relationship in Sodomora is like it's always intertwined, uh, which is uh, very Einsteinian, I guess. <laughs> um, but 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 also like go, uh, um, so this this idea of circular time and concentric time. So. Um, it, Markian talks about it in the introduction, but you also you mentioned the mitten, and this the, 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 so for Sodomora, this idea of like continuity from the past to the present, and always like you know especially in the mitten, oh what would have happened if and then but you cannot go back in time, so you can only relive this in your mind in your memory, um, so, so that becomes extremely extremely important, and many many stories would have this kind of going. In fact. Oftentimes, as we were going through the, through the stories with Sabrina, like the first, the initial pass, the first read, we were like, wait, is this, when is, so we were like, the time frames are always confusing. We're like, wait, let's establish the timeline, like a more linear timeline, because otherwise, like, you, uh, you know, even though like each story is a couple of paragraphs, but you get lost into what is he remembering, what is he recollecting, and what is actually happening now. 
uh, or, you know, like the story about the cat and the rain. Uh, you know, when are they have when are they drinking that wine? Is it now? Is it yesterday? Is he remembering this now? But this happened, be, you know, in the power, maybe in the distance, distant past. So that's always, you know, that's one of his um, one of his fortes, I think. So the more is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the construction of this sort of time sort of it happens naturally as you grow older and the amount of memories and past references you have begins to subsume the present and future ones. Um, but it's just uh, brought into relief by Sadamora since he also has this whole sphere of kind of intellectual rec- recollection that he engages with through all of the research that he's done and all these texts that he's sort of read and internalized almost as though they are a part of his own memory. Yeah, I, it, it was it, it's it was especially interesting in the story to me because it wasn't just a um, this dichotomy between past and present and how they interact and will seep into each other. But right, like you had said, the um, the what if. And so you have like mm-hmm. an alternative outside of time. Um, what if uh, that, right, right. that's constantly playing uh, with that memory? Yeah. Uh, did this happen? Did it not happen? How do, yeah. how do we know for sure that our memories are, are have truth to them or? Exactly. Or, you know, but also, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned, I'm glad that you mentioned um, um, Rukavechka, the mitten, uh, because and this is something that, uh, uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm going to say for the first time, because in our previous discussions it, it, with Sabrina or, you know, elsewhere, when we talked about the book, we haven't really advertised this so much. But I think one one um, point that is kind of often overlooked when we read, so what be, again, because like there's so much pressure with all the inner text and everything, and all these complicated philosophical concepts, but many, well, okay, not maybe not many, but some stories, including the mitten, are mildly erotic, you know, and <laughs> you would probably not expect this from, an, you know, uh, a guy in his late 80s, uh, although some of them might have been written earlier, but even in Rukavechka, he, he, like this, the, the very tantalizing, like it's, it's really tantalizing, but on a very, very subtle linguistic level, when you read this, you cannot but feel this, this idea, like, there's got to be something going on. Um, uh, you, like he, uh, another another similar episode is in the intersection when he sees, uh, you know, a, the, the, a, a lady that he probably knows um, in the bus and she smiles at him, but then the bus leaves. He's still thinking about that smile, blah, blah, blah. So that also very temporal in the sense of like, how do you capture a snapshot in, in the world of things? You know, the bus just departed, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, but also one other p- uh, episode that is kind of erotic is in the uh, story, The Silver-Haired Wind, when this young girl is reading a book on her lap and, and then and the, the wind is, is turning the pages. But then so the more kind of uh, in, on a different instance, he compares himself to the wind. Uh, and then and then you start like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. But so, so very interesting, but very subtle, very intellectual. It would not s- surprise me. Well, it's funny because each of those there's like a moment of like the the desire cause i think it's in the silver haired wind where there's a desire to say something and then he says no that would be would break the moment that'd be inappropriate yeah, yeah each exactly of these, exactly yeah, each of these yeah. things there's that distance that can never be um broached. sure um, yeah i wanted to i think we're we're kind of come to the end but i we did wanted to to ask you both briefly i think uh, sabrina you've already kind of mentioned this what are your favorite stories from this collection uh, sabrina you mentioned uh the owl ramon i think earlier you, you talked about was it the felled shadow um mm-hmm. just talk about you know, briefly what what draws you to those two? Sabrina, you go first, please. Um, I think, yeah, my favorites are probably The Owl and The World Between the Window Panes. And I also love Vigilate. Um, and I love The Garden, which you mentioned. That's one of my favorites. Um, but yeah, I think all of these ones do a really good job of describing the physical space um, and yeah, sort of the the built infrastructure of the city or the countryside. Um, and they're all quite different. The owl, I think, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think I, I just really enjoyed sort of translating all of the, the various objects um, and sensations he has in the attic. And you you also like the credenza, the credenza the credenza remember as well, how you yeah. how we had to what you had to like do so much thinking and like even working with your dad and like what what are these uh, different items for like the silverware and all the the kitchen items what, yes. what they what they're called like all the little pan little you know saucepans and stuff like that 
yeah, 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 exactly. So sort of like establishing all of this realia that then kind of attaches you in a very concrete way to these different eras and emotions that he's experiencing. Yeah, my favorites were the three clear, the top three are very clear to me. So that would be Carpe Diem and... Um, and uh, so the felt shadow, which I already discussed, and also the mood. So be, because we already spoke about carpe diem and the felt shadow, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the mood really quickly. So I think I was really attracted to the stories, not specifically because of the subject matter or the style or what have you, but because how difficult these three were to translate. Uh, so like, you know, in terms of their challenges, um, so we already discussed carpe diem and this this very phrase how it changed in Sotomora's interpretation, and we also spoke about the the uh, uh, onomatopoeic pun in in the felt shadow, but also the mood. So the mood is a phenomenal little story about music, about his um, his time uh, in in the opera. And I you know I've been to the Lviv Opera going back to 1901, the beautiful building. Uh, very Viennese looking, um, although, you know, people in Vienna don't really like the opera house, but whatever. <laughs> they call it the the, the cape that didn't rise. Um, <laughs> but in Lviv, it, in Lviv, it's absolutely gorgeous. And so I kind of, I can almost imagine that I know the setting really, really well. Uh, I've, I've had tours there and I can almost imagine Sodomora sitting in that, in the, in the Lviv opera house and waiting for the, for the show to start. But what he does with that story linguistically, like what all the instruments do, blah, 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 blah. So that was unbelievably difficult to translate. But the the crux of it all came down to the word nastri, which in Ukrainian, if you look look it up in the dictionary, that would mean the mood, and that's what we have in the title. But he also talks about the tuning of the instruments. You know, and the 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 wordplay uh that that, that that the story is so imbued with is just phenomenal. And you sometimes feel helpless, but at the same time, you know, we, we now like you guys made, made my day. Cause if, if there are more readers like you who would see so many things in those stories, like you, you have done, then I think Sabrina and I have done a, 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 a have done our job. Uh, if these things come through to you, um, despite the fact that there are so many, you know, untranslatables and so many asymmetries between Ukrainian and English. Uh, and you know the the, the socio temporal and the, the socio political and temporal historical contexts. Um, so yeah, but the, the mood is another story about music. Um, also, the whole that, thing that, is that, one yeah. sentence. The entire yeah. story is one sentence. Yeah. So kind of like reconstructing how all of these different clauses fit together was like sort of separating out all the different instruments yeah. in the orchestra. Yeah, <laughs> one huge run on sentence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you both for sharing. No, I, I, I mean, I think you both did a, a, a at the beginning in both of your translators notes, you talked about the difficulty of of bringing uh, bring Sotomora into English, and I, I think you both did a fantastic job. I, when I'm reading this, it's uh, the 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 prose is is fantastic, and I think the ideas are are really something to chew on. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I know we have a lot of other readers who probably, like we said, we might be they might be encountering Sotomora for the first time. But if they come to this and they absolutely love it, uh, in your in your expertise and in all of your wisdom, where should they go next? I'm always curious to hear what what you might recommend after reading this. That might be my wow. hardest question yet. <laughs> yes, it is the hardest question. I was like, I should have prepared for this. Um, I will. I will say this. Um, we briefly touched on the story, the garden that ends uh, that ends with um, a German tanks plowing through the garden, uh, and that goes back to you know when Ukraine faced Nazis in in the forties. But um, and Sudomora doesn't really talk about the war explicitly uh, in any of these. Um, I'm not sure what is more recent writing if there's more explicit mentions, but just for the record, uh, as somebody who was born in Ukraine and still has family in Ukraine, um, Ukraine is going through really, really difficult times now. And so I think one thing that Sodomora does, he, um, you know, his words are his weapons. And so he, he tries to open up uh, his, his motherland as this beautiful country uh, with beautiful, smart people. But right now, these people are also fighting for their survival. So I think 
uh, my recommendation would be anything that explains Ukraine as a country. Serhii uh, Plohe's The Gates of Europe, uh, History of Ukraine. So Serhii Plohe is a historian um, at Harvard and one of the most prominent historians of Ukraine today. Um, anything by Timothy Snyder, who has actually a, a course, um, a, a open access course, a Yale course um, on Ukrainian history. Um, but also more contemporary writers from Ukraine. Um, one of them was um, killed um, by the Russian invaders uh, when she was at a cafe uh, in one of the southeastern Ukrainian cities. I think it was Kramatorsk. Uh, Victoria Amelina. Uh, she was recently translated into English. Check out anything from the Harvard uh, Ukrainian uh, series, uh, Ukrainian literature and translation published by Harvard. Uh, Lost Horse Press um, has a whole series on Ukrainian poetry. So check out there, you know, just kind of Google Lost Ho Horse Press and you will see you will see lots of Ukrainian contemporary Ukrainian poets translated into English. Uh, interestingly, uh, Ukrainian literature in translation is on the like there's many, many more translations of Ukrainian from Ukrainian literature happening today than even a decade ago. Uh, is just so sad and so ironic that it it had to you know we couldn't have just been enjoying this uh, without it but it, it 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 pretty much the war had to happen for this interest to um, to kind of you know peak and and um, uh, for more people to sort of be wondering about about Ukrainian literature but yeah these would be my recommendations sorry for not kind of being very specific but uh, you know I would definitely read Victoria Amelina uh, just because she was killed and she was in her forties. Um, uh, and a very young, very, very promising, very talented writer. And like I, I think recently this has been translated uh, uh, into into English. Uh, Stanislav Asyev, uh, another Ukrainian intellectual who was actually uh, in torture uh, in the in the, the, the these torture uh, uh, camps um, uh, that were established in the newly occupied territories. So, so um, his uh, um, his work is entitled "In Isolation." But that's pretty much about his uh, his experience in the in the Russian uh, torture camp in in his native city of of Donetsk. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you yeah. for sharing. If for any listeners, you'll be able to find links to. I'll have links for those in the show notes. So if you want to take a look at them, you'll be able to find them easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would echo Roman's suggestions to check out more Ukrainian literature. And it is so wonderful that there's been an efflorescence of translation from Ukrainian in this moment. Um, and one other recommendation I'd make is for the Uzbekistani writer, Sufbad Abbatuni. And he's a, a Russophone writer based in Tashkent. And if you read Russian, I really recommend his book that's called um, Tashkent Novel, Tashkentsky Raman. And actually, it's one of the projects I'm thinking of working on next. Um, but it does it does some of the similar things to Sadam Water. Like, it really... <laughs> incorporates these different atmospheres of cultural mixing and mixing of time periods. Um, so it takes place in late Soviet Uzbekistan and follows a young um, student named Lagi, whose uh, almost husband goes off on this archaeological expedition. And the archaeological expedition is one, just one of the kind of time machines Im implanted metaphorically in the plot. So there's all these different... Um, excursions into memory and sort of pre-memory that are woven into the novel. So you might encounter sort of a long dead relative or yourself in a previous life um, and lots of different languages, Sanskrit, Uzbek, German are kind of woven organically into the Russian text and all of these different sort of spiritual and religious traditions like Buddhism and shamanic rituals, fire worshippers, um, all of these kind of, and conversations with ancestors add to the texture of everyday life in, in Soviet Uzbekistan. So That's good. That yeah. sounds like a nice light translation to do afterwards. <laughs> yeah, really relaxing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, it is actually, I'd say it's quite a lot um, lighter than Saramora. Fantastic. Thank you both so much for sharing. And, you know, like we said earlier, if you're interested in any of those, find them in the show notes. So that links are right there. So no excuse. There's no work for any listeners. You got them right there. 
All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. We really appreciate you both taking the time out of your day to come talk about this incredible collection of works that uh, Sotomora wrote and you two have um, translated so beautifully. Thank you for having us, but also special thanks for So we've, we've had a few shows before that, but uh, I would like to uh, uh, give you credit for actually looking at the stories and, and not just having us talk about them, but um, uh, thank you for reading the stories so, uh, so carefully uh, and, and asking such great questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really priceless to hear your reflections on them. For what it's worth, we still have like a page and a half of questions. So <laughs> yeah. If we want to do another three hours, we can do it. Yeah, y'all are lucky. We had, we, had like, we had a full page of like theme, thematic questions, so you got off light in this interview. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, it's, it's good that you didn't send them in advance because then we would be like, oh my God, now we have to answer. <laughs> All right, Matt, before we completely wrap up today, I have to ask, what are we covering next week? Next week, we are getting back to our film basics. We are going to be talking about Strike by Eisenstein. Uh, I'm going to be dropping a, a load of research that, that I've been working on for like five years onto this episode. So, uh, you know, enjoy. I like how and, we're uh, slowly sprinkling in all of your uh, movie research like once you know, every couple of months. We're like getting little crumbs getting leading up to your uh, well, my, for sure your thesis. My final and, reveal and dissertation, which will be a 30 hour straight lecture. <laughs> <laughs> You've actually been our, our real. We decided that it wasn't difficult enough with uh, our seven months of life and fate. You've actually been recording all of your lectures on these movies and we're yeah, getting released yeah. as one episode. Yeah, exactly. But it's it's easily accessible online. You can find it on YouTube for free if you wanna if you wanna watch before listening to the episode. To help keep our show independent and for exclusive access to all the notes containing the research that went into this episode, head on over to our website, SlavicLitPod.com. Before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current supporters. Yes, and that is Alice, Dear Ball, Cynthia, Seamus, Camille, Emma, Lauren, Erica. Michelle, Juliana, Diane, Oleg, John, Timex, Melissa, Baron, Aldo, Ben, Gabe, George, Claire, Amy, Allie, Soraya, Jackson, Molly, Emma, Mike, Marianne, Mickey, Eric, Reagan, Mike, Peter, Eric, Ben, Claire, Jeff, Inez, Mai, Robert, Joseph, Daniel, Lou, Nina, Gary, Janice, Mary, Anne, Isaac, Emily, Amanda, Caitlin, Yitza, Irene, and Pack Rob. The music in this episode was Sarai Kino by Paramotka. You can find more of their stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify. The links and spelling are in the show notes. You'll hear from us again soon. 